Stonewall Jackson was the legendary Confederate general, the right-hand man to Robert E. Lee, feared by Union troops, undefeated in all his many battles, and finally, ironically, cut down by his own men in a tragic case of friendly fire. May 2nd, 1863, Chancellorsville, Virginia. It was a time and a place that marked more than just another battle between Confederate and Northern forces. During the confusion that often accompanies war, the day gained a certain distinction. It was there that the South's foremost general fell. In an instant, the man who protected the Confederate cause, the legendary war hero, the mighty Stonewall, was shattered. And along with him went the hopes and hearts of the people from his homeland. Most of the actors in the world's drama are those who come and go and perform their work without enchaining our highest attention and admiration. But now and then, an individual appears mocking his advent in state with evidences of marvelous superiority to his contemporaries in some high sphere of human action. We cannot always define by name his splendid traits, and for want of a better term, we say he is gifted among mortals with genius. Such was Stonewall Jackson. He was the very genius of war. Colonel F.W.M. Holliday, Commander 33rd Virginia Infantry. Stonewall Jackson was a, a quiet, cautious, uh, thoughtful family man of whom almost no one had heard or ever would have heard, except for the fact that the American Civil War came along and gave him an arena in which he became one of the leading actors. He became, of course, the greatest lieutenant Robert E. Lee ever had in the South's foremost army. Uh, that in itself would give him a certain status, a certain station uh, in the uh, affairs of the Southern Confederacy. But his campaigns in the field just created this myth and this legend of a man uh, who was in a hundred places at one time. This is a man who defeats three Yankee armies single-handedly. And all of them combined outnumbered him by about two to one. There's no way something like this cannot have a catastrophic, more likely cataclysmic effect on the course of a war. Just the fear that Jackson's name came to inspire in some Yankee soldiers gave him that much of an edge on them to begin with, if they knew they were going up against the mighty Stonewall. All you had to do was mention Stonewall Jackson and there were immediate fears for the safety of Washington and those earthen forts that ring the city and safeguarded it would be manned to the fullest by Union troops. Jackson was a, truly a legend in his own time and the inscrutable nature of Jackson, I think, furthered the myth. Jackson is a complicated man because he looked at things with such incredible simplicity. You obey or you disobey. You are a God-fearing man, or you are not a God-fearing man. And his whole life, I think, was a rather simple life of a man who had very complicated workings. Stonewall Jackson genuinely believed that God was watching his every step. God was on his side, and he was guiding every one of those steps. And before the Civil War, and particularly during the war, because his steps were so often successful, he absolutely believed that he owed that to God and that he was God's instrument on earth. In his style, in his persona, Jackson was certainly not the Napoleonic ideal of a, of a dashing soldier. He was rather rumpled in his appearance, certainly eccentric in his mannerisms, would be missing a button on his coat and, and not think much about, of it. Uh, rode a rather sorry-looking horse, not a prancing stallion. And yet, the very fact that he wasn't given to that foo fa fra and foppery enabled him to establish a rapport with a common soldier, with a man in the ranks, that's perhaps the most important bond that can be formed in warfare. As Jackson led them to success after success, giving all the credit for God, uh, asking them to do the impossible, but leading them to success, and at the same time leading them to fame, it was a respect a high esteem, which they felt for General Jackson. Jackson's the necessary Greek hero of the war. 
He does all the right things. He has just enough oddity of character to make him personally interesting. He's brilliant at what he does, and he dies at exactly the right time. He, he sets up the beginning of the creation of myth and speculation of all the might have beens. Long before he would become the mighty Stonewall, long before he would gain legendary status, and long before he would become the physical embodiment of Confederate patriotism, Thomas Jonathan Jackson lived a life almost foreshadowing what was to come. For 37 years, he would hone the tools he would ultimately need to help shape history. He was born in 1824 in what is now West Virginia. By the age of five, both his parents were dead. By the time he reached adolescence, all his siblings but one had died as well. He had been placed with a relative, Cummings Jackson, who then became responsible for his upbringing. He was raised on a large uh, estate that uh, contained uh, gristmill, sawmill, racetracks, uh, fields, herds. It was a diverse agricultural uh, enterprise. So he learned to do many things and to do them well. Uh, like most farm boys of that era, he went to school three months a year in the short period between planting and, and harvesting. Uh, and uh, I picked up the rudiments of arithmetic, uh, English grammar and composition, and armed with that minimum education, he goes to West Point. In many ways, that was an entree into the world of, of gentlemen, of, of um, respectability, and he, he made the most of that opportunity. And he was somewhat self-conscious, I think, in his efforts at, at um, self-improvement. You would not have thought at West Point that he could ever have been a military genius. He went in a, a poor, often deficient, even in social amenities, even knowing which knife or fork to use at a meal. Uh, in the first year at West Point, he was ranked solidly in what West Pointers today still call the immortals. He was at the very bottom of his class. His experience at West Point was almost his life in microcosm, starting out a little bit behind catching up and then forging onward. There was not so much brilliance and intuitive uh, learning ability as, as there was determination. At West Point, he began keeping a book of maxims, and, and he would jot down these little one-liners he heard, which uh, impressed him. And one of his favorite, of course, was, you may be whatever you resolve to be, and he lived by that axiom. All lights were put out at taps, and just before the signal, he would pile up his grate with coal, and lying prone before it on the floor, he would work away at his lessons by the glare of the fire, which scorched his very brain till a late hour of the night. This evident determination to succeed not only aided his own efforts directly, but impressed his instructors in his favor, and he rose steadily year by year till we used to say, if we had to stay here another year, old Jack would be at the head of the class. Fellow West Point cadet. When Thomas Jackson graduated from West Point in 1846, he was 17th in a class of 59. A combination of persistence, perseverance, and determination became the driving force behind the steady climb that landed him within the top third of students. These same characteristics would later turn the ordinary man into a legendary general, but in 1846, a hero's reputation was still over a decade away. War, however, was not. Fighting in Mexico had already begun, and Jackson, along with his classmates, was ordered to proceed to the scene of action. The character of the man was fortified in combat. It was in Mexico he first established himself as Thomas Jonathan Jackson, the fighting man. From the moment he got to Mexico, he was anxious to fight. There was no hesitation, no fear in him. He wanted to get into a battle to find out if he could fight, if he did well at it. And of course, within uh, a year, he had been in three major engagements, been brevetted for gallantry three times. Out where the bullets really were flying, uh, Jackson was very much distinguished. In the assault upon Mexico City in September 1847, he'd been second in command of a battery that was on one of the causeways that approached the city. A bad place to be, raised up above the surrounding ground. And uh, the Mexican army was sweeping that causeway with fire from muskets and from cannon, too. And there were his guns exposed on that causeway, and he just stood to them and ignored the danger. Later marveled to someone that he hadn't really noticed the danger. He wasn't ignoring it so much as he was unaware of it. 
Jackson was certainly the most celebrated member of the class of 46, and he came out of the Mexican War, a brevet major. Jackson learned many things uh, in the Mexican War. Uh, um, he learned, of course, many military things. He learned the value of flanking movements, the value of staff work, the value of uh, concentrated attacks. At the same time, he learned orderliness and discipline and devotion to duty, and suddenly realized he liked those kinds of things very much. And he comes out of the Mexican War uh, fairly well committed to the military. By the end of the war, Jackson's experience had given him recognition for the first time as a celebrated soldier. But more importantly, he had armed himself with more of the necessary characteristics for which he would later become famous. Along with perseverance and determination, there was now obedience and devotion to duty. But the Civil War was not yet even a spark on the horizon. However, Jackson's battle experience still became a valuable asset, winning him more than brevets to major. In 1851, he was offered a position at the prestigious Virginia Military Institute, better known as VMI. Colonel, your letter of the 28th informing me that I have been elected professor of natural and experimental philosophy and artillery tactics in the Virginia Military Institute has been received. The high honor conferred by the Board of Visitors and selecting me unanimously to fill such a professorship gratified me exceedingly. I am, Colonel, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, 1851. He was admired because of successes during the Mexican War, and this was a military school. But by and large, they viewed him as a no more than moderately successful teacher, and he was not a big fish in their ocean. He did not have the instincts of a teacher. Jackson saw teaching the way he saw everything else, as a case of white or black, right or wrong. Everything was very rigid. There are no shades of gray in Jackson's intellect. And teaching, I'm sure, for him was exactly the same thing. And it was teaching, in his case, by rote. He uh, had a poor eyesight. Uh, and as a result of this, he could not or would not study at night. So on the afternoon before the next day's classes, he would memorize his lectures. And then the next morning, he would go into class and reel off, literally reel off this mem memorized lecture which was fine for the A students. But if the C and D students asked for elaboration or expansion, this was beyond Jackson's ability. All he could do is back up like you would reverse a reel or a tape and then run the same thing by again verbatim. Uh, the student had better not ask a second time for elaboration because Jackson normally took this as insubordination and might put the student on report. As a professor of natural and experimental philosophy, Major Jackson was not a success. He had not the qualifications needed for so important a chair. He was no teacher, and he lacked the tact required in getting along with his classes. Every officer and every cadet respected him for his many sterling qualities. He was a brave man, a conscientious man, and a good man. But he was no professor. Colonel Francis H. Smith, Superintendent VMI. It was in his other capacity as a professor of artillery tactics, in which he not only was more comfortable, but had the undeniable respect and attention of his cadet corps. Over and over again, you will find these graduating cadets or these high-ranking cadets in their final year at VMI making statements like, well, he's, he's a hell of a man in class, but if I ever had to go into battle, I would want to go in with him. Again, the foreshadowing that marked his life continued. Many of these same boys would later become his men. They would also become the backbone of artillery in the Confederate Army. They followed him in command at VMI like they followed him in war. There's something in his very mode of life, so accurate, steady, void of care or strife, that fills my heart with love for him who bears his honors meekly and who wears the laurels of a hero. This is fact. So here's a heart and hand of mine for Jack. Lee Wilbur Reed, VMI Cadet, 1858. The cadets had placed their faith in Jackson while he placed his with God. It was only after he came to Lexington that he finally found the denomination that he'd been seeking for the, the past four or five years, and this was the Presbyterian Church. And it's almost incorrect to say he became a Presbyterian. Jackson became a Calvinist, really, in the old line, a hard shell kind of faith. His was 
a religion of the book and the book taken literally. Jackson would have been a fanatic probably at any religion he happened to adopt because it was the way his turn of mind worked. Again, this single-minded dedication to a goal. Jackson became known for his strong beliefs, but it was not his faith that caused the people of Lexington to single him out. Jackson had the kind of a personality that would attract people to home in on his quirks because he was an odd duck anyhow. Certainly not unique, but amongst the general run of Southern men of his class, he was still a little peculiar. He was very much the hypochondriac. One of the most frequently told stories about him, and it apparently is true, is that he rode around with one hand in the air because he thought that one side of his body, the limbs on one side, were larger than the other, and the blood needed to drain out of one. And he attributed uh, this or some of his other uh, woes to eating pepper and therefore quit. Uh, he tended to eat things he did not like, but under the premise that that would be better for him than to eat things that he did enjoy, the earthly pleasures, you said. He once ate bread with butter on it, uh, decided he liked it so much that he ate the bread without butter from now, and he feasted on this Spartan diet. Despite his oddities, Jackson was an accepted member of the community. In Lexington, he had found his faith. In Lexington, he had become a gentleman, and in Lexington, he learned about love. In the early 1850s, he met Eleanor Junkin, the daughter of Presbyterian minister and president of Washington College, Dr. George Junkin. Once again, he was faced with a new experience. He was not even sure what was happening to him in the early 1850s when he and Ellie, as he called it, became very close friends. And it was up to a colleague of his who taught math at Washington College who laughingly told Jackson that he was in love, that all these pains and strange feelings he had was romance. In 1853, Jackson and Ellie were married. They lived happily in Lexington. Then, after only 15 months, the marriage ended. Ellie and their unborn baby died during childbirth, and Jackson was devastated. He relied on his faith to overcome his grief. I frequently go to the grave of her who was so pure and lovely, but she is not there. When I stand over the grave, I do not fancy that she is thus confined, but I think of her as having a glorified existence. Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Finally, in 1856, two years later, he took a summer tour of Europe. He came back thoroughly fascinated by all the things he had seen, but also Jackson had the idea that life might be much more satisfactory if he had a companion. And so he contacted another minister's daughter, Mary Anna Morrison, and renewed a friendship with Anna. And then in July 1857, they were married. It looked as if Jackson would spend his life living in Lexington, but by the beginning of the 1860s, the dark clouds of war were looming over the nation. I'm anxious to hear from the native part of my state. I am strong for the Union at present, and if things become no worse, I hope to continue so. Thomas Jonathan Jackson, 1860. Jackson has very much the Virginians' attitude, uh, the border state attitude which is that the Union was the Union, and he was loyal to it as long as it was together. And if Virginia happens to join with the Confederacy, then that's where Jackson's allegiance is by. By 1861, the country was tearing in two, and Jackson believed it was not only his duty to defend his home state, but a necessary fight of faith. Jackson believed that God had ordained a civil war on this country for reasons he nor any other mortal had a right to question. But this was a scourge Old Testament fashion of the land. He believed that the side that displayed the most confidence in and respect for the Almighty would ultimately win and triumph in this war. In April of 1861, Jackson marched into war, and soon the country would be introduced to the legendary Stonewall. For Jackson, the Civil War marked the beginning of a new era. For 37 years, he had unknowingly prepared himself for his final 23 months. By the end of April, 1861, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, the fighting man, had returned. And by the end of July, 1861, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, the mighty Stonewall, would emerge. Stonewall Jackson was a colonel at the beginning of the war. He was still Thomas Jackson. No one had given him his nom de guerre of Stonewall yet. And he was posted to the frontier of Virginia, which was Harper's Ferry. Fought a little battle uh, the first week of July, 1861, at Falling Waters. Really not much of an affair at all. And then 
commanding five Virginia regiments. He led them as a brigade off to the first Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, as the Southerners called it. At Manassas, uh, it was not so much a battle between armies as it was a collision between two armed mobs, with inexperience being the prevailing sentiment. Wavering had been the fortunes of the day, and the hours passed slowly to men who'd never tasted battle before. Henry Kidd Douglas, aide on Jackson's staff. The key position on the whole battlefield was Henry House Hill. And Jackson and his brigade with an artillery battery were positioned on that hill. Jackson, obeying orders, stood his ground, while a brigade of the Confederate soldiers, under the command of General Bernard B., fought part of the bloody battle below. B's brigade is just being kicked to pieces by the Federals at this point. Jackson's brigade is up on Henry House Hill, in position, but not really doing anything. B's men are in advance of the line and are about to be virtually disintegrated. And B says something to the effect of, look, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Let us resolve to die here and we shall conquer. Shortly after, B was wounded, finally dying a day later. But his words lived on and the legend was born. It was in that instant that Thomas Jonathan Jackson became Stonewall. Over a century later, there's no question as to where and when Jackson was renamed, but the moment is not without controversy. There still remains the question of the meaning of Bee's words. Was Jackson standing strong as a stone wall, or was he merely frozen on the hillside while his fellow countrymen were being killed? There are writers today who will say, well, Bee didn't really mean that in a positive note. He meant that Jackson was dragging his feet at Manassas. Now, the evidence is too strong for that kind of argument to have any validity whatsoever. Jackson was holding a position he was ordered to hold. When the Federals finally got close to these five regiments standing like a stone wall, Jackson, in fact, held them and proved to be a pivot on the day. He was the bulwark on which the Federal advance stopped and eventually was broken as more Confederates came up. It was a Confederate victory, but more than a battle had been won. The South now had their first war hero, Jackson and the men he had trained left the field symbolic of the courage behind the rebel cause. Together, they represented the strength and protection of a stone wall. It became part and parcel of him and of the brigade. The brigade that had stood there was promptly called the Stonewall Brigade. And eventually, it was the only unit in Confederate service that had a formal nickname. The rest were all numbered. Jackson had a tremendously motivated command under him. They were all Virginians. They were all fighting for their homeland. Virginia had been invaded. The invaders' heel was on their hearths. So they had, a, they had the best motivation any man can have to go to war. He did an incredible job of taking a, a bunch of uh, militiamen, old veterans, young recruits, and welding them together into a reasonably efficient military machine. He drilled them in the typical Jackson fashion. Uh, he paid no attention to time, no attention to need, no attention to meals and rest. On an average, they did about 20 miles a day of hard marching. The average person can easily walk 20 miles a day if you're in good shape, but not carrying 40 or 50 pounds of pack, an eight pound rifle, wearing perhaps wool or even heavy cotton uniforms in a hot summer sun. There was a charm about General Jackson which inspired all private soldiers under his command with a sublime, unquestioned confidence in his leadership. An indescribable something amounting almost to fascination on the part of his soldiers that induced them to do uncomplainingly whatever he would order. Major General M.C. Butler, Division Commander, Cavalry Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, when you thought of Jackson, you thought of long, hard marches, and his men became accustomed to them. Uh, they took them as a challenge. Uh, many of them thought that what he was asking was impossible, but they said, by damn, we can do it, and they did it. It was not the inspiration of fear, but a deep and abiding devotion to his person, to his character, to his matchless and unerring leadership and self-sacrifice. Major General M.C. Butler. To the South, they were known as the Stonewall Brigade, but to each other, they were Jackson's foot cavalry. As for Stonewall, in 1861, he was promoted. He was now General Jackson. During the Civil War, the legend was not only growing, but alive then, and people took hold of it and made themselves part of it and basked in its reflected glory, which, of course, redounded to the military good of the Confederate States because 
Uh, the more elan the units had, the better they would, they would fight. Success breeds success in all human endeavors, and most especially, it seems to me, in military ones. In the spring of 1862, the legend grew when General Stonewall Jackson, his famous foot cavalry, and a small army all fought for their homeland in the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley was a lifeline to the south. It was a source of provisions and a northern invasion route. The Union wanted the territory, and Jackson and his men were sent to help stop them. In battle after battle, Stonewall led a small contingent of Confederate soldiers in defeating massive numbers of federal troops. At the climax of the campaign, uh, Jackson had a slightly more than 15,000 men, still a very small army, considering the fact that the Federals got well up toward 80,000 men, first and last, chasing him from one point or another in a variety of armies, at least three of them who came after him. And so he darted about using his men's legs and using his uh, grasp of the ground and confused those people and beat them again and again. He would attack in the morning, attack in the evening, attack at night. People kept thinking, there have to be more soldiers here. This can't possibly be the same group of people striking here, striking there, striking there. The result was that the northern side kept large numbers of troops in a vain effort to defend against a group that was much smaller than it actually was. In about 48 days, his men marched almost 700 miles. They fought a dozen different battles. Uh, they defeated three Union armies. He was going up against four to one odds, coming at him from north, east, and west. And he just continued darting here, jabbing there, probing here, stabbing there. And he was arguably the most famous general in the world uh, coming out of that campaign. All of these generals essentially worship the memory and the tactics and the legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleonic tactics, Napoleonic strategy was what they sought to emulate. The ability to keep your opponent off balance, to strike him at one point and then move rapidly and strike him at another. And Jackson lived up to the Napoleonic ideal and he was recognized as being the first Confederate general to flummox a succession of Union opponents and his genius was recognized at the time. I don't know that Stonewall Jackson was doing things differently than other generals. He was doing them with more determination and better. People looked at the whole war, and Jackson had stood it on its ear. This fellow with the, the euphonious nickname and the fellow who had done so much in the valley, and he, he, he was on the threshold of fame, and he built on that with tremendous successes. Here you have this mythic figure who was alleged to sleep on the field with the soldiers, to eat soldiers' rations, to be able to stay in the saddle for days on end, to get men to march as rapidly as cavalry could move, and to get them to fight with ferocity, of course he'd be a feared person. How do you defeat him? How do you defeat him in a myth? Jackson's reputation was worth a battalion or two. The Federals knew who he was. They were scared about him. Nannies in the North would uh, try to shush crying children and say, Stonewall will come get you. He, uh, part of being larger than life was that you were a bit of a bogeyman to the enemy. And when Stonewall Jackson arrived, it was time to start worrying. Stonewall Jackson became a household word. Um, he was well known both in the North as well as the South. He was a fearsome figure, um, and he won. And his, his great fame had to do with the fact that he was giving the Confederacy a great sense of hope at a time when there might have not have been uh, that much to feel, feel hopeful about. The mighty Stonewall had become the foundation of strength behind the wall of Southern beliefs. But for Jackson himself, it was fate, not fame, that fueled the fire behind his success. He was a man, among other things, who regarded modesty as a great virtue and practiced it very hard. Every victory he achieved, he ascribed to the indulgence of a kind God. Almighty, the Almighty gave him victories, not Stonewall Jackson. It chills my heart to think that many of God's people are praying to our ever kind Heavenly Father for the success of the army to which I belong. Without God helping, I look for no such success. My prayer is that all the glory may be given unto him to whom it is properly due. Stonewall Jackson. During the war, it was as if Jackson's life's lessons had finally joined together. Over three decades of preparation had given him the dedication, determination, and devotion needed to win the battle. And although the combination may have been the ingredients in the recipe for success, they may also be credited with creating the darker side of the mighty Stonewall.
Jackson's salient military shortcoming is his inability to get along with his subordinates. Subordinate after subordinate uh, came under arrest for violating just the most minor infractions. The men who answered directly to him or maybe just one layer below him, uh, they all had a very uncomfortable time. Despite his failings, Jackson was still a leader among Southern men, but even the mighty Stonewall had to obey orders, and beginning with the spring of 1862, the commands came from General Robert E. Lee. Between Lee and Jackson uh, developed the ingredients of, of a military team which I think has no equal in the history of warfare. They became a model partnership. There is nothing in the Civil War uh, that can compare with it. Lee had the vision of a great quarterback to see the game as a whole and what would work. And Jackson is his great running back with the ability to put that call into execution. Together, they were a locomotive of destruction. In June of 1862, during the campaign of Second Bull Run, Lee released Jackson, and the mighty stone wall struck the Union supply line, forcing the Federals under the command of General John Pope to pull back. Then, in the fall of 1862, during the Antietam campaign, the pair once again proved their power. Lee split his forces in two, and Jackson was in command of one. For three hours, the mighty Stonewall resisted concentrated Union assaults while continuing to hold the Confederate line. In battle after battle, they took the country by storm. Then, in May of 1863, they began their most famous and what would be their last fight together during the campaign of Chancellorsville. At Chancellorsville, the, the Lee Jackson partnership uh, came to its apex. It, it, it was a battle that on paper Robert E. Lee could not win, but he wins it, and he wins it in great part because of Jackson. Lee and Jackson had their final meeting the evening of May 1st. Together, they devised the plan that is still considered a masterpiece. The Confederate Army was outnumbered over two to one, but typical of the Lee Jackson style, they were willing to make a bold move. By May 2nd, with their small force, they were ready to take on the Federals. Jackson, with about 30,000 men, marched a bit more than a dozen miles on a set of wagon roads that were just so primitive that Pioneer Corps had to go out front and cut the stumps low enough that the axles of the artillery and the trains, the ambulance trains and ordnance trains, could get over the stumps. And at the end of all of that risk and endeavor, he had crossed the T of the Federals. They were facing one way, he was facing 90 degrees different, overlapping them a mile on either side. By approximately 6 p.m., Jackson was in position. Then, in the final moments before the attack, Jackson looked at his men, many of whom he had known long before the war. At the moment of ordering his men into action, Jackson made the famous statement that the Institute will be heard from today because a number of the high-ranking officers of his corps were VMI graduates. Undoubtedly, many of them had lambasted him as young cadets, and now they were going to their deaths to follow old Jack in the battle. He was in the midst of the greatest victory of his career, indeed the biggest victory in the Civil War in the East. A tremendous crushing blow that sent almost half of the Army of the Potomac scurrying back towards Satan. Jackson did not want to stop. You know, he's got this fury, this ferocity going. Let's drive for the kill. And Jackson, in a totally unrealistic uh, move on his part, rides out personally through the woods uh, to try and ascertain exactly where the Federal line is trying to stabilize. He's out actually between the lines in a time when it's dark, the battlefield's full of smoke. Jackson's own people are badly disorganized because they've been running pursuing the fleeing Yankees all day. So their own organization is tremendously torn up. They don't know friend from foe. Jackson had issued orders. The orders were there to the Confederate soldiers that Union troops were in the woods somewhere. And so all these uh, Confederate soldiers saw or heard first were it was riders coming through the woods, coming from the direction of the Union lines. It was Jackson and his staff, but the Confederate soldiers logically concluded that these are Union horsemen galloping toward them, and so they opened fire. The fog of war was upon the battlefield, and Jackson was caught in the confusion. With a volley of friendly fire came a pivotal moment in the war. The bullet from the gun of a rebel soldier became the blow that would ultimately help shatter the mighty, 
but mortal stone wall. It was on May 2nd, 1863, that fire from Confederate arms not only shot away many of their own men, but gave away the rebel position to the Federal forces. Suddenly, the enemy's artillery opened on the scene and added to the confusion and horror of it. And verily, in the language of General Sherman, war was hell that night. Henry Kidd Douglas, aide on Jackson's staff. Several in Jackson's staff were dead, while the general himself lay suffering from various wounds, his most serious injury, a severed artery in his left arm. In 1863, amputation was the only option. Dr. Hunter McGuire performed the operation, and when it was over, Jackson's old friend, Beverly Tucker Lacey, took the hero's limb, and a quarter of a mile from the field hospital gave it a proper burial. The limb lay buried, but the general lived on. The word had spread quickly, but along with the battle came a break in communication. The forces of Lee and Jackson had been split for the fight, so it was six hours before the information reached Jackson's superior. Through the darkness, a couple of staff officers rode to find Lee, and in the early morning hours of the 3rd of May, uh, they gave him that message, and he, of course, was, was very upset at it, and one of them started to describe the nature of the wounds, and Lee said, stop, stop, don't go on, I don't want to hear any more about that, it's too painful. Lee writes back uh, to Jackson, a very brief note, saying, you have lost your left arm, I have lost my right. Lee, symbolically, losing that thing that he exercised so well, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee's right arm. Fearing a Union assault, orders were sent from Lee to remove Jackson from the area. After a 27-mile rocky wagon ride, Jackson arrived at his final destination, Guinea Station. In a small structure, the general was left to recuperate. His wife joined him, while a team of men kept a careful watch on his condition. It was soon clear the wounds were healing, but Jackson was not. Within days, the general was diagnosed with what was then a deadly case of pneumonia. Physicians of that day were familiar enough with pneumonia that they could predict almost the hour of death. And so that morning, Jackson's personal physician informed Mrs. Jackson that the general would surely expire that day. A group of his uh, most intimate staff members and his wife was there and the physicians in the room and his breathing got shorter and shorter and more and more labored as, uh, as his lungs filled up and ceased to function. And finally, at about 3.15, the, the clock ticking, the clock that's still there ticking, uh, in the delirium, which had had him more and more under its control, he said, uh, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. And then, as he had done so many times, he led the way. This afternoon, my watch stopped at a quarter past three o'clock. At that moment, the heart of Stonewall Jackson ceased to beat, and his soul departed for heaven. Henry Kidd Douglas, Adon Jackson's staff. On May 10, 1863, at the age of 39, the mighty stone wall died, and with him went the high hopes of the South. He fell like the eagle, his own feather on the shaft that was dripping with his own life blood. In his death, the Confederacy lost an eye and an arm, our only consolation being that his summons could have reached no soldier more prepared to accept it joyfully. Jefferson Davis, President, Confederate States of America. The pall of misery that went across the South when Jackson died was one of the major blows to Confederate civilian morale. They had regarded Jackson as invincible just as they regarded Lee as invincible. Everyone feels as though he had sustained a personal bereavement. In the agony of this overwhelming sorrow, we exclaim, would God I had died for thee. Charleston Courier. As soon as Jackson dies, the South starts looking for another one. And all future potential heroes are measured by the standard of Jackson. All fail to measure up, of course. But now and then, some, when some general is successful in a small campaign, he begins to be called the new Jackson, but only briefly. Jackson died, but his memory lived in the hearts of his soldiers, and on many a subsequent hard-fought field, I heard them exclaim, oh, for another Jackson. Brigadier General James H. Lane. He became an embodiment of all the virtues, um, all of the hopes, all of the aspirations um, for, the, for the Confederate cause. 
in the years following the war, there, there rose up an enormous sort of cult of the lost cause. And Jackson was very central to that. I consider General Stonewall Jackson the most extraordinary man as a soldier that I ever met. Never excited, he was as cool under fire as he would have been if attending to his devotions in his church. Had he been spared to the Confederacy during the years of 1863, 64, and 65, it is my belief that matters would have resulted differently. Major General Henry Heath. <laughs>